this evening we're here to talk about the Japanese garden in Portland, um, which I have to admit I haven't visited. I've visited Portland, but not the garden, so that's even worse. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't there for very long, is my excuse, and I had other things to do. Um, but it looks absolutely fabulous, and I'm sure we're going to see some beautiful slides about it. Um, and uh, so obviously that will be Steve Bloom, the aptly named Steve Bloom, will be talking about that. But I will leave it to our chair for the evening to introduce Steve in, in detail. Um, so our chair is Nick Luscombe. Um, he is a London-based uh, radio broadcaster, producer, DJ, and music consultant. Um, but he has a lot of Japanese connections, not all of which I fully understand. But I, I am aware that you've been doing this um, big project to collect the soundscapes of mm -hmm. Japan and, and make them available on the internet and also using virtual reality to, to put yourself in these soundscapes in Japan. So if you want to say any more about that in, what, in your own introduction, um, sure, feel yeah. free, but over yeah. to you, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> Can everyone hear me okay if I speak from here? Is that okay? Um, yeah, so I was in um, Japan back in uh, December to meet with uh, Kengo Kuma, the architect, um, to talk about uh, a music and architecture project that I'm developing with Kengo Kuma's office. Um, and he was explaining to me about uh, the Portland Japanese Garden, which was completely new to me, I have to be really honest. Um, apologies, you know, I did not know about this sooner, but, um, but then, um, and suggested I met up with Steve, and we met in December, didn't we, I think it was. Mm -hmm. I remember the Christmas tree in the West End, yeah. it was pretty mm -hmm. impressive. And, um, and then I just kind of got to know Steve a little bit, and talking about the whole process of the garden, just found it fascinating. And even though I work for the BBC, I do sometimes listen to Gardener's Question Time, uh, but I'm not angling for a job, I just want to make that absolutely clear. <laughs> so I'm not an expert, but I'm, I'm looking forward to learning a lot more. Um, the, the garden is beautiful, Steve will take you into the detail on that. We'll have a little um, Q&A session at the end if anyone's got any questions as well, I'm sure a lot of you will have. Um, I've got a few questions as well, but, um, but right now I'd like to hand over to Steve, who's the CEO of the uh, Portland Japanese Garden, to give you a presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a wonderful uh, pleasure and honor to be here. Um, I always start all of my talks uh, with the disclaimer that um, no one is to ask me plant questions. Um, I am the CEO. I'm not a gardener or a horticulturist. I don't come from a plant background. I was a classical musician by training. Uh, who started out in the symphony orchestra business and then um, got into management of symphony orchestras and then moved into the, uh, 13 years ago, became CEO of the Portland Japanese Garden. Um, all the pictures that you see here that we'll be scrolling through are of the Portland Japanese Garden. Um, <clears throat> I'd love to tell the story of this picture right here. I'm going to hold it on this picture right here. <clears throat> I was uh, uh, flying one day from Tokyo to Ho Chi Minh City on vacation. Uh, just to go to Vietnam and explore, and I was on uh, ANA Airlines and opened the in-flight magazine, and there was a five-page article about Kyoto and the beautiful gardens of Kyoto and why you should visit Kyoto in the fall. And in the centerpiece um, was this beautiful picture of the fall colors, um, and at the bottom the quotation said, um, come to Kyoto in the fall when the colors are spectacular. And it was a picture of the Portland Japanese Garden. <laughs> and so I felt very proud that we had done so well that even ANA didn't know the difference between the Portland Japanese Garden and a garden in, in Kyoto. Um, so yes, indeed, all these pictures are of the Portland Japanese Garden, and even Japanese uh, are often surprised to see that. Um, I want to give a little bit of history about the Portland Japanese Garden, tell why we came to be, um, talk about the evolution of the garden, uh, what we've done over the last... Um, 10 to 12 years, uh, and then talk about uh, really the future of the garden and a, a bigger dialogue uh, that, that is now going on. Um, and uh, let's start back in 1963. In 19, well, let's go back farther than that. 1959, Portland and Sapporo, Japan, became sister cities. It was about 20 years after the war was over, um, and <clears throat> this idea came up that we should, in order to understand each other as people better and to open up uh, mostly economic ties, uh, between Oregon and Japan uh, have a sister city there. Uh, and so the sister city uh, was, uh, relationship was created. And at that time, someone had come up with the idea that wouldn't it be great to build a Japanese garden uh, to kind of memorialize this new relationship. Um, nothing happened for a couple of years, and uh, the association for the sister cities uh, association started in 1959. And then in 1962, 
um, the, uh, the crown prince of Japan and princess of Japan, now the emperor and empress, at least for a few more months, um, they came to Portland. Uh, they were on a peace mission. Uh, and there was this renewed energy and excitement about Japan uh, at that time. And so really out of that visit, finally the mayor of Portland at the time said, okay, we're going to do this. We're going to build this Japanese garden. Um, so in 1962, he uh, 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 appointed a commission to study the possibility of doing it. And in fact, then in 1963, uh, the, they hired a designer from Japan uh, and broke ground and started the, the building of the garden. So the garden was designed by Professor Takuma Tono, who was a professor at uh, Tokyo Agriculture University at the time. <coughs> Actually came from Hokkaido originally, went to Hokkaido University studying landscape architecture, but then went on to the United States early on after in his studies uh, and studied at uh, Cornell University. Uh, in New York, uh, landscape architecture there. He went on to be um, an expert on Japanese landscapes in America and an expert on American landscapes uh, in Japan uh, and was traveling back and forth uh, for some time. So there are other gardens in North America, uh, Japanese style gardens that he designed. But the Portland Japanese Garden ended up being his master creation. Um, so the Portland Japanese Garden now um, is is universally considered by the Japanese garden field in Japan to be the most authentic Japanese garden in the world outside of Japan. Um, and up until recently, we weren't the largest, um, although with our expansion now, we're probably the largest in size, um, but uh, certainly was the most authentic, the most well-maintained, the most well-kept, um, uh, considered to be the finest Japanese garden outside of Japan. There are a couple reasons for that that I'm going to talk about. One of them is Professor Tono's design. Um, within that design, and you'll see that throughout these pictures here, uh, in, in choosing the site for the, for the garden, uh, he did not choose a flat landscape. You'll see hills throughout the garden. Um, and then you'll also notice that there are, are large um, old um, Douglas fir trees and cedar trees that are in the garden. And typically in Japan, you would not uh, have these large old trees. Um, you would have a flat area for the garden. Uh, ponds that you can stroll around. Uh, and then Japanese gardens, one of the design techniques of Japanese gardens is that you're bringing nature down to human scale. So you're pruning everything down so that pine trees that are 30 to 50 years old that might be 30 to 50 feet tall are actually 10 to 15 feet tall. So you're bringing nature in and, and you're humanizing it. You're giving a more human interaction with nature. Well, he decided that he was going to integrate these grand old trees of the Pacific Northwest and these hills in uh, the western uh, part of the city of Portland. He would integrate that into the actual physical design of the garden instead of taking all those trees out or choosing a flat site. So it's this integration of Japanese garden, and we'll get to a picture at some point I'll point out, um, and even that moon, moon bridge picture that I, I pointed out earlier, you have this beautiful Japanese garden in the center, but then these towering trees all, and hills all around it. Um, so here you can see some of these older trees uh, that are just wrapped it, itself around this, uh, this Japanese garden. So that was one of the reasons was that he integrated the, the natural beauty of the Pacific Northwest of the United States with Japanese garden design. He also decided um, to, uh, to look at this as kind of a museum of gardens. So instead of having one kind of Japanese garden there, he decided that there would be five different kinds of Japanese gardens. Um, so if you were to go to Kyoto today to see all the different kinds of gardens we have in one place at our garden, you'd have to go to five different places in the city of Kyoto to see all the different kinds of gardens. But he integrated them seamlessly so that you actually, unless you were aware, you might not know that you've gone from one style garden to another. So we use that to teach people about the different kinds of styles of Japanese gardens that we have uh, as well in Portland. So really the design um, was one of the reasons that this garden is, is uh, as special as it is. Um, the other thing is, uh, one of the other uh, reasons was the maintenance of the garden. Um, from the very beginning, uh, Professor Tono wanted this to be authentic, and he was still teaching actively <laughs> at Tokyo Agriculture University, and he couldn't be going back and forth on a consistent basis. Travel back then was much more difficult. He had students to tend to and classes to teach. And so what he did was he began what we call the garden director system, in which every three or four years, 
he would take a young Japanese uh, gardener who had just graduated from Tokyo Agriculture University as a landscape architect or as a, a maintenance professional, um, and he would send them to Portland to live in Portland and to oversee the implementation of his master plan um, to make sure that the garden was built out. Uh, let me just stop right here and demonstrate to you. Um, so this is our sand and stone garden, um, and you can see um, beautiful Japanese garden here, um, but surrounded uh, by these hills and the beautiful trees of the Pacific Northwest. So we integrated these two things where um, these types of gardens traditionally in Japan would have been meant to be on the side uh, of a temple um, for, for, um, for meditation in a Buddhist temple. Um, here you see we don't have a temple. Um, it is just kind of cantilevered out here over this hillside. Um, where you can go down and you can sit in front of the garden and meditate, or you can see it from an elevated position. So he was taking advantage of, of the landscape and, and really creating something unique but distinctly Japanese at the same time. Uh, so the, the, the design is really quite remarkable. Um, <clears throat> so what he did in order to make sure this garden was built out probably in 1963, um, they started construction. In 1981, the major pavilion in the garden was the last major construction that was added to the garden. So it took that long. They didn't raise all the money at one time. They opened the garden section by section as they were able to open it to the public um, and, uh, and doled it out over eight different garden directors uh, overseeing the, the implementation of the building of the, uh, the landscape. So each of these gardeners came and they added their touches to the design. Um, to the build-out, um, Professor Tono would come once a year, check in on things, make every, sure everything was okay, and then the garden directors would report back to him. But what that did was that over the course of the first 25 to 30 years of the garden's history, it was not Americans trying to figure out what a Japanese garden should look like. There was always a Japanese garden director there who was native Japanese, who was trained in as a designer, trained as a maintenance professional, there on site overseeing the maintenance and the building of the garden. Um, so this was very, very critical in making sure that the garden was as authentic as possible. Um, there were many of these gardens that were built later in which um, I call it the Ben Watt syndrome. They built these gardens, but nobody thought about Ben Watt. You know, after it's built, who's going to maintain it, and, and is it going to be authentically maintained over time? Um, so Professor Tono made sure that over a long period of time, um, that in fact, indeed, we did have that kind of maintenance. <clears throat> the third reason I think the garden um, ultimately became as extraordinary as it is, is that um, even though it is part of the Portland Parks system, it's in Washington Park, which is uh, one of the largest metropolitan city parks in the United States, um, it's over 400 acres. Um, we are 12 acres of that. But from the very beginning, the mayor of Portland said, we're not going to make this part of the city parks program. We're going to set you up as a separate nonprofit organization. Um, you're going to have a separate independent community board. Um, so the city council is not going to oversee this. Our parks department is not going to oversee this. But it's going to belong to the community. The community is going to oversee this. So the mayor asked individuals in the community and created its very first board right in 1963, and said, we'd like for you to build this garden and, and oversee it. Um, why is that important? For a couple of reasons. Um, the community from the very beginning had ownership of the garden. They had, they had from the very beginning, began to build what, what is pride of ownership of the garden. Um, oftentimes, as we know, when something is left to a bureaucracy or a governmental agency, there's not a lot of ownership or care of that. It's something we have to do because it's our job. Um, with this, there was a lot of passion, and people were passionate about Japan. Oh, hold it on this slide for just a minute. It's actually on auto, I'm sorry. Oh, is it really? Okay, then. <laughs> That's fine. We'll pause. Okay, great. Um, so, <clears throat> um, where was I? <laughs> I got off track. Uh, so, it was, it was belonged to the community at that time. Um, right from the very beginning, they took ownership uh, of the garden. Um, and the second reason that this is really important is because of fundraising, because of financial resources. So whenever our governmental agencies and our parks department and the organizations um, that manage the arts in a community run into financial trouble, what's, what gets cut? The parks get cut, you know, because basic services are the most important thing. Uh, and then arts and everything else uh, get cut. That's okay, let it go. Let it go. <laughs> so. 
everything else uh, gets cut. And so by having a community board run this, they were able to provide the financial resources that it took to support the garden over the years. So there were never a lack of resources to make sure that it was maintained well, that when um, new buildings needed to be built, when there was new construction, uh, when staffing was required, all of those things were provided for by the community um, through fundraising and philanthropy. So that was the other, the third reason I think that this garden was so successful. Um, many of the gardens that were built after it uh, were really, they ran into financial trouble because they were part of a city program which always got cut and the gardeners didn't realize how to maintain the garden, what the appropriate design was supposed to be uh, for all of those reasons. So, so Portland was fortunate. So over the years, um, the garden grew um, and grew kind of slow, slowly at first. Uh, and you'll see that um, about 13 years ago I came to the garden and at that point the garden was kind of a sleepy place. Um, and the board really, there was some political turmoil on the board and there was a group of board members who wanted the garden to be kind of their, their they didn't want more people coming. They thought more people's going to ruin this beautiful, tranquil place. Uh, and board members at that time said, you know, that's not right. We're a public nonprofit organization. We should be reaching out to the community and doing more to engage the community and fulfilling our potential. So when I was hired, that's one of the things they hired me to do was take a look at this garden and figure out how could we fulfill its present potential. And one of the things became obvious to me that while the garden was a beautiful place to visit and it was lovely, um, it was not a place that engaged our communities and we weren't utilizing it as a platform to teach many things about Japan, not just about Japanese gardens and not just about nature, not just about design and horticulture. And so these pictures here you see um, 13 years ago, 12 years ago now, um, I appointed our first uh, curator of culture, art, and education at the garden. And her job was to take the garden and to, to fully utilize it as a platform for teaching all kinds of things about Japan. Um, and as we started to do that, the people started coming. I mean, it was just remarkable what happened. Um, we started an Art in the Garden series where we did um, art exhibitions. Um, and because we're not a museum, we don't do exhibitions of work that are a thousand years old. We actually prefer to work with living artists because they can come, they can demonstrate their craft, um, we can sell their works and it benefits the artists. Uh, so we're promoting the art of Japan and the craft of Japan. We can do comparative exhibitions. Here this is Native American robes of the Native American Indians and we did a, current, a comparative exhibition to the Ainu of, of Hokkaido uh, in Japan. Um, so really taking a different kind of look at Japan, too, and how it relates to our region in North America. Um, and the other thing which I think is demonstrated right here, and one of the reasons that artists love working with us is, if you work in a museum, you have a white wall, sterile place to display your art. Well, look at the backdrop we have here. The garden is a backdrop uh, for the art. Uh, and now we're doing commissions of, of works by artists in response to the garden. Um, so it really creates a more dynamic opportunity to, to explore uh, the, Japan, the, the art of Japan as well. Um, so as we started going through this, um, beginning 13 years ago, um, we had at that point, the first year the garden opened to the public in 1967, we had about 30,000 visitors that year. It had grown uh, 13 years ago when I arrived. We had about just over 100,000 visitors a year coming to the garden. I'll talk a little bit about where, where we are now uh, in a bit. Um, but we saw uh, just enormous growth uh, happening. Um, this was our 50th anniversary Isamu Noguchi uh, exhibition that we worked with uh, out of New York City with the, the Noguchi Museum there. Um, we also became to, came to realize that um, uh, there was an opportunity in terms of the field of Japanese gardens in North America um, to help the field as a whole. The Portland Japanese Garden was the first sister city garden built um, after World War II in North America. Um, we were then the model for 170 gardens that came after us that were built as friendship gardens or sister city gardens after the war. So all of those gardens were built. There's now between 250 and 300 public Japanese gardens in North America, we estimate. Um, those are varying sizes and organizations and such. But many of them, um, we realized uh, over time, uh, first of all, we weren't connected. We didn't know each other. We weren't talking to each other. And that was an issue and a problem. Um, but second of all, um, there was no, uh, the maintenance of these gardens in these other places in North America were just horrible. 
um, because they never thought about the then what. And so this garden was built and then left and forgot about. So what was supposed to be this fantastic and wonderful example of Japanese culture and design and craft, actually in many corners of North America, had become embarrassments for Japan. Um, they were dilapidated, the design had gone down, the maintenance was just not there. And so the first thing we did was we created a network. Um, we worked with a group of leadership gardens in North America, and eight years ago created the North American Japanese Garden Association. And we were able, for the first time ever, to bring these 250 to 300 gardens together under one association and to begin talking to each other. And then the second thing that we did was we've now created the uh, International Japanese Garden Training Center. One of the problems with people who want to learn these skills and these techniques, these crafts, is that unless you uh, can speak Japanese, uh, can take seven years to find a sensei who will take you on as a student for no less than seven years, or you're not worthy of studying the craft, and have the time and effort and energy and money and financial resources to go to Japan, how do you learn these things? Um, so we've created a training center in Portland where, in fact, as you can see, um, uh, Students come from not just North America now, but from all over the world. As a matter of fact, we have one of our alumni right here from the Kew Gardens, who was here this past summer, who participated in these programs. And we're doing multiple years where you can come, uh, ultimately, as we build this out, um, for three different years, uh, three different tracks, uh, to learn this. And then eventually, we'll work to have a certification program for the U University of Oregon Landscape Architecture Department, um, so that you can take these skills and you go back to your own garden, and you can apply these things without having to, to, to go to Japan and do it. But we're also connecting some of these things to Japan. We're bringing in the best craftsmen and, 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 um, and gardeners from Japan, and then also looking for opportunities to send people to Japan to learn these crafts as well. But one of the things we also realize is that there's the hands part of this, um, which is the pruning and the bamboo fence building and the stone masonry and all. But then there's the heart of it, that if you're not a Japanese garden, and you didn't grow up in Japan and, and learn about these things, of the, the, the heart of Japan, you know, how do you build that into a Japanese garden and its maintenance and its design? Um, and so one of the things we're also doing is, is teaching things like, um, like tea and like calligraphy and the, the softer arts that are related to Japanese gardens uh, so that there's an understanding. Um, oh, can we? I can just keep you back. Yeah, on just keep me back on that one. Um, so, uh, so that there's an under, a deeper understanding of the Japanese garden as an art form, uh, and not just as a landscape. Uh, it's not just the technical part of it, but it's the heart part of it as well, and understanding why and how these things were designed. <clears throat> so we now have this, um, and my apologies for the, <laughs> for the PowerPoint. Um, so we now have this international training center, uh, which you can come and do that. So, What's happened over the last couple of years uh, is that we saw this enormous growth, and we realized that this five-acre garden, which now had hundreds of thousands of people coming to it, was not going to be able to sustain the visitorship anymore. Um, and that, in fact, all of the programs that we were doing, everything we did was selling out, and we would have to add second and third programs. Um, and we had one building to do everything that we did uh, in that one building. Um, and our membership began to grow. And so we realized we were going to need to expand. And so a few years ago, we, we set forth on an expansion project. Um, and we uh, engaged with Kendo Kuma, um, who is one of the lead designers in Japan today, um, to design for us um, our cultural village. Let me take that photo now. Uh, at the Portland Japanese Garden. Uh, so that we would have more facilities to be able to do the work that we do. And so we created a new entry uh, area, which we see here. Um, so that there's a more of a sense of arrival. We doubled our, more than doubled our capacity to take admissions uh, into the garden. Um, and then you can see also these hills and the old trees and such. And um, there was this old tradition in Japan going back, you know, a thousand years or more that um, people for shrines and temples would make pilgrimages to other parts of Japan um, to go to a particular shrine or, 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 or temple. And in doing so, um, in traveling, outside of these temples would grow up little villages because they would need a place to stay and they would need food to eat and they would need souvenirs to buy to bring home to their family. And so the whole idea of the garden was that we would build this cultural village outside the entrance to our garden because many of these, these gardens were derived from the shrines and temples of Japan. So we decided to ask Kengo Kuma to design a, a cultural village for us. And so you can see here at the bottom of the hill, we have to walk up this beautiful hill 
there's this antique gate, and you can see that the, the village <coughs> begins to emerge here at the top of the hill. And it's our little cultural village that we have. Uh, and as you come up, we have this beautiful glass bridge and a staircase that takes you into this central village. And then a central courtyard. <clears throat> and inside the courtyard, we can do cultural festivals, and we can do performances and activities and events. So it's a very dynamic, open-air space. We have three buildings uh, in the, the courtyard. One, two, uh, use it quite, one, two, and three. Um, and the first of which is our um, Japanese Arts Learning Center, in which we have a uh, classroom space. We have a performance and demonstration area here. Um, we have a gift shop, we have an art gallery, we have a library. We believe that we have the second largest Japanese garden library collection in the world after Tokyo Agriculture University, which is now housed here. We have my office right up here, <laughs> which is the most beautiful office in the state of Oregon. Uh, it's right here is my office. And this is our gift shop. We had a gift shop that was uh, 167 square feet that we were doing over a million dollars in sales out of. Um, we now have a four time bigger gift shop, which we're doing close to two and a half million dollars in sales out of. Um, and all of these doors and walls and glass windows uh, that face the courtyard can be completely opened up to the courtyard or completely closed off so that we have very versatile space depending on the weather. In our gallery with our stadium seating and we can seat about 80 people, and in total, we can do about 125 or more people in this space um, for events. Beautiful gallery for exhibitions, our new gift shop, our performance, our uh, four and a half tatami mat demonstration area, and you can see here how the doors are now open to the courtyard. So we can do performances and tea demonstrations, or bonsai, or ikebana. Uh, demonstrations in the round here with people sitting or standing in the courtyard and watching. And then our library with a George Nakashima uh, uh, library table, George being, ha having been one of the probably top five American furniture makers of the last century. He was Japanese American. Um, and this is the executive office. That's my office right there. <laughs> so. Um, and really taking a look at this uh, and, and wanting to blend it into the landscape around so you can see the green roofs. It helps with environmental sustainability and keep, keeping the, the buildings insulated both in the summer and the winter, um, but also helps to, to, to blend from the natural surroundings into the built surroundings here with the green roofs. And here you'll see our our Japanese wall. This is our maintenance and training facility where we do a lot of the, the classes. We have our own gardeners work out of there as well. But then we do some of the training uh, for the, uh, the training center. We added a bonsai garden. We work with local bonsai artists. Um, and we have a curator who selects from local bonsai artists. So we don't have our own collection yet because we just opened this a year and a half ago. Ultimately, we'll have our own collection, but we haven't moved to that yet. But it actually gives our local artists an opportunity to, to um, exhibit their work, which is really wonderful. They love it. It engages the community. And then here you can see from the existing garden, we're standing now in the existing garden looking at the new, and you can see how the buildings just kind of blend right in. They're not too heavy on the landscape, and that was part of the, the intentional design. And then our tea cafe, which is cantilevered out. It looks like it's floating off the end of this hill, the side of the hillside. Um, we wanted, the biggest thing that we heard from our visitors when they came is they wanted to experience Japanese tea when they came to the garden. But we only had a formal tea ceremony tea house. We didn't have a cafe. And so we built this cafe. Um, and it is our little tree house. Uh, and we, it's the Umami Cafe by Ajinomoto. Um, even though it, Ajinomoto doesn't provide the tea, but they did provide the $1 million gift to name the tea house. Um, we work with a company out of Tokyo called uh, Jugetsudo. Uh, and they have uh, now three cafes. They work with ours. They have um, one in Tokyo and one in Paris. And so we are kind of their third location. Um, and it gives people an opportunity to experience Japanese tea culture. The Pacific Northwest uh, of the United States has a very strong coffee culture. So we deliberately decided not to serve coffee because we were afraid everyone would order coffee and no one would order tea. And that's, as you can see, how and what we serve. 
And this is the view from my office, looking down on the tea cafe. And then our stone wall here. Nothing exists like this anywhere in the world outside of Japan. We um, worked with a 16 generation uh, stonemason from Japan who did the Nijo Castle, the Nagoya Castle, Osaka Castle, did all the walls for those castles in Japan to come. And he's, uh, he is um, in his late 40s, and he stood there as we were beginning this project, and I asked him you know, if he's excited about it. And he said, oh, God, yeah. He said, my family's been doing this for 16 generations. He said, but I'll tell you a secret. He said, this is the first brand new castle wall I'll ever build. Because no one's building castles in Japan anymore. <laughs> right? So um, it's just remarkable. All the stone came from eastern Oregon. And you can see the scale and the beauty of it. And so we brought stonemasons in from Washington, California, and Oregon, and Japan, and they worked as a team so they could work on learning each other's craft as stonemasons as this was being built. And then this is looking down on the village from above from the hillside behind. In the central courtyard where we've done kabuki performances and no performances and uh, obon festival and bonodori. And so what comes next? Um, well, what have we become now? Um, what we have found now, and remember we said 13 years ago when this was still a closed, you know, tight organization, we were looking at about 100,000 visitors per year, which had grown in the first 40 years, um, you know, from 30,000 to 100,000. Um, with the opening of the new expansion, we now see over half a million visitors per year coming to the garden, which is really remarkable. We have a full-time staff of 125 people working at the garden. We have 19,000 members of the garden who pay their annual membership uh, to come to the garden whenever they, they like. And we're doing over 360 cultural and education programs uh, at the garden per year. Um, so with all of this, um, we also understand that we are, again, at our capacity in terms of the physical 12 acres that we have. So we thought about how do we then leverage um, what we have in the garden to do more? Um, and maybe even do more, not just in Portland, but in other communities that might need our help. Um, so we thought long and hard about how do we do that. And we, we talked about the creation of what we're calling the Japan Institute. Um, and the Japan Institute is designed to have three global centers. Um, one is the International Japanese Garden Training Center, so that we can help these gardens uh, outside of Japan um, to improve the maintenance and design of those gardens so that they become better representations uh, of Japan. Uh, and so that is already up and running. We're building it. We've gotten now of the three-year program. Two years are now running. We're adding the third year next year. Um, and we feel really good and, and strong about that. We're also going to create a global center for Japanese culture and art. Um, and that uh, will mean that we're going to continue to do the work that we're doing in Portland in terms of art exhibitions and performances and Japanese cultural festivals and things like that. But how do we make it global? Uh, and that comes with collaboration and working with other, um, other partners around the world outside of Japan and some in Japan um, to do joint exhibitions, traveling exhibitions, to have artist and residency programs in which we're sharing artists um, and, and sharing scholars and lecturers and things like that. So we take the resources that we have and we're sharing them with other institutions around the world. So the Center for Japanese Culture and Art, to do commission uh, of new works by Japanese uh, artists um, that they can share. Um, performances, no performances, kabuki performances, classical musician, uh, cl classical composers uh, who can come. We did our first uh, classical commission uh, for a, a, a chamber ensemble by a Japanese composer last year as part of our grand opening year. Um, so really looking at more collaborations that we can do with institutions and organizations outside of Portland. And then the third thing is um, uh, what we're calling the International Exchange Forum. Uh, and this is really um, taking the lessons that we've learned in our community about the garden uh, and sharing them and having dialogues with other communities around the world. And, and what are those lessons that we learn and how can, those, how can these great gifts of Japan and these great lessons that we learn from Japan be shared and implemented in communities around the world? And so I want to end with one story and as an example of, of that. And it's the story of our first garden director. Um, and kind of this universal idea that the garden was built on of mutual understanding, of bringing Japan and, and Oregon closer together after the war. Um, after the war, 
you know, the U.S. And, and because of the war, the U.S. and Japan were just great enemies. We had no greater enemy in the world uh, at that time than Japan. Um, so this garden was built with the idea that we could do better. So Kinya Hira was the first garden director who came uh, in 1963. He was in his early 20s at the time. Um, and he spent four or five years in Japan. Um, and when he left, or I'm sorry, in Portland, when he left Portland, he vowed that he'd never return to Portland. His, his experience was so bad, was so horrible. He lived on a trailer on the site where the garden was being built, um, and often there were um, public demonstrations from protesters who did not want this Japanese garden in their community. Um, and in fact, um, he was assaulted and stabbed at one point. Uh, he had stones thrown at him. Um, from time to time, he would come home and they would spray paint on the side of his trailer, go home Jap. Um, you killed my father. We don't want you in this community. So there was so much anger still from the war, even 20 years later. Um, and so his experience in Portland was, was not a good one, and he left and vowed that he would never return. Fast forward almost 50 years, and I came to the garden, and I realized that we had all these eight garden directors who had never, uh, who we had lost track of, essentially. And so one by one, I found them, and I would meet them and talk to them. And after I found all eight of them, um, I thought, gosh, we should gather them in Portland. They've never been together all in one place at one time, and what an opportunity for living history to be right here with us, going back to the, the founding of the garden. So I invited them all to come back, and everyone agreed but Hirasan. He said, I, I, I vowed I would never come back, and I won't. Um, and so it took me almost a year, of a couple visits. He had moved to Los Angeles and gone on to design gardens for ben, uh, Tony Bennett and Frank Sinatra uh, in Beverly Hills. Um, and worked with his daughters and talked with them and convinced them finally to come back. And we had five days of events and, and organized activities around the, the garden directors. We called it the reunion, even though they had never been together. Um, and we had a panel discussion at the Portland Art Museum, and over a 1,000 people came to hear their stories of the garden. And we had a, a fundra fundraising dinner, um, and over 500 people paid you know, to come and, and to honor the garden directors. And we had these walks through the garden with our volunteers and our docents and with our gardeners of living histories and it was just an amazing week and an amazing thing happened over the course of that week what we realized was in fact the garden had done its job right 50 years later this community that wrote go home jap on the side of this man's trailer who stabbed at this man who threw stones at him had come together and this organization was now the most revered cultural institution in the state of Oregon. That in fact, Oregonians understood Japan in a different way. They understood the Japanese people and their culture and their art in an entirely different way. And Hirasan looked at that and thought, oh my god, this garden has done its job. It's healed the wounds of this community and of the war. And yes, it took 40 or 50 years to do that, but in fact, it has done its job. And in seeing that, Hirasan let go of all of that pain and that anger from the time that he was there. We now have no greater supporter, supporter than Kinya Hira. Um, he will do anything for us, anything that he can do to support the garden, because he sees that it actually had done its job. So it's a remarkable story. And, and so there's a universal value in that that is not about necessarily Japan and Portland or Japan and the United States, but, but, but about gardens. Um, as an opportunity, as a platform, to understand each other better from a different point of view, from an angle of a people's art, its culture, um, its design, its aesthetic, as opposed to maybe what we see about a culture in the media or what we learn about them in the news. So here in London, what if we were to come here and have a conversation about the success that Portland had and how do we apply that in London? Well, what could an Islamic garden do, not attached to a mosque, but a standalone Islamic garden in, in London do to help over time soften opinions and ideas and the knowledge about the Islamic people and their art and their culture? Could there be a parallel there? So those are the kinds of conversations that this International Exchange Forum will have not just in Portland, but in, in communities around the world, um, where we think there's, there are relevant things to take from all of this. Um, so 
we're going to have a conversation, but I just want to give you an overview of kind of a little bit of the past, the, the present, what we've done in recent years, and, and where we go. Um, the other point I'll just make is this same community um, that, that built this garden from the very beginning that most of the community didn't want, today the community rallied and they actually donated $37 million of private donations to build this expansion. So this garden that was not wanted, 55 years later, the same community invested $37 million in individual private donations to, to, to make it bigger and better than it was before. Thank you very much. So I, I think we've got a little bit of time for the conversation, but like I said, I really want to get everyone involved who, who wants to speak as well. But I mean, the thing that strikes me particularly is just seeing those images. The landscape just feels like it's perfect, right? It's, I mean, it, outside of Japan, there must be so few places that have those you need Japanese qualities within, a, within an area. So that must obviously contribute to the thinking. Yeah, you know, I think also the other advantage that we have is that we're at the same, uh, um, uh, essentially we have the same climate as Japan, although it's reversed. So they have very wet, you know, summers and lots of rain and the rainy season are very dry winters. Well, we have very wet winters and dry summers. <laughs> So we can grow all of the plant material that they grow in Japan, Japan essentially. We have amazing moss and you know Japanese maples and cherry yeah. trees and all of those things. But it was really Professor Tono, there were five final sites that he looked at for this garden. Mm -hmm. And he is the one who had the vision, who saw this could just be an extraordinary place, um, even ever before it was built. And he was yeah. looking at old you know, concrete pits where the bears lived and the elephant house where the meat was stored for the lions and all these other things, how he envisioned what it could be. But that's the job of the landscape architect. They're, they have to have a vision for 50 years from now, not for what can we do today. Sure. And what did Kango Kuma make of it? Because that, that expansion is incredible as well. Like you said, it blends in so beautifully, doesn't it? I just wonder what, what did Kengo Kuma's team make of it? I mean, it must have been extraordinary for them to discover the place as well. Yeah, so, so we had a sense, uh, although we went through a public process uh, uh, for the selection of the architect, I always had a sense from the beginning that it was going to be Kengo Kuma, because knowing his work and such. But even back then, he was so famous that I thought, oh my god, you know, he's got offices in China and Paris and all over, and we're this, this little nonprofit garden in, in Portland. He'll never you know, be interested in this. Um, so. I, I enlisted the garden in doing its job. And because once people come to the garden, it does its job. You walk in, you're like, oh my god, this place is amazing, right? Um, so I, my goal first in meeting him was just to get him to come to the garden and not even talk about the project at all. So I invited him to come to do a, a, a lecture at the garden on Japanese architecture. And he came, and then when he saw the garden, again, his eyes were open. And he's like, wow, in Portland, Oregon? What is this doing here? Uh, and then I began the conversation about the project and what we wanted to do, and um, and he has been fantastic. He is this is one of the most important cultural projects he's ever done um, because he does a lot of office buildings and private homes and things like that. But this speaks to his culture um, so much so that he donated a quarter of a million dollars um, to the project himself personally. Wow, really, yeah, that's amazing, oh, incredible. Yeah. Um, you talk about sustainability as well. Could I ask you a few more questions about? It? So that, that looks obviously a very important part of of a lot of our lives generally today. So what are the things you do in terms of sustainability at the garden, aside from the kind of initial kind of architectural responses? Yeah, well, everything, we also look at the operation of the garden in terms of making sure that we're environmentally friendly, everything from the use or non-use of pesticides um, uh, and what kinds of things we use to fight you know, bugs and things yeah. that might destroy the plants. Um, so we, we take a look at that very carefully. But then also water management is a big thing in, in Oregon. Uh, and so renewing and making sure we have the most current uh, water systems and, oh, and using water. You'll see the green roofs that we had as well. Um, one of the other things we do, uh, it, with he even in, in heating and cooling these buildings. Um, so we don't have forced air. We don't burn gas or anything. We actually um, drilled 24 geothermal wells 300 feet down into the ground below the garden. Um, so that um, the cool air in the uh, summer is brought up to cool the buildings. So the, the temperature remains constant down there. So all we're doing is continuing to move air up, uh, up and down into the buildings from below the ground so that we're not burning uh, as many fossil fuels uh, as one might think. 
So, okay. so those are some of the things that we do. But throughout yeah. the, the building, there's a, have you ever heard of the LEED system, L-E-E-D? It's a system of architecture in North America in particular that you can get a silver, gold, or platinum rating, and it tells you how sustainable your building is. Um, and Portland is the leading LEED city uh, in North America, and so we reached the LEED gold standard for this project.